and, uh, and welcome all of you this evening. Um, a small and select um, group this evening, but, um, but I know we're going to have a fascinating talk from uh, Dr. Ira Lieberman and Dr. Jennifer Eastern, um on the future of microfinance. Uh, both Ira and Jennifer are contributors to the recent book, The Future of Microfinance, published by the Brookings Institution Press, which Ira co-edited. Chapters from the book on the growth and commercial evolution of microfinance, on financial inclusion in India, and on Asia and the Pacific are available to download from Wolfson's website, um, where you'll also find a flyer with details of how to get a 20% discount of the book. And today Ira and Jennifer will be speaking not only on the topics covered in the book, but also on the profound effect that the COVID crisis is having on the demand for the services that microfinance institutions can provide, and also on the financial health of the institutions providing them. A few words about our speakers today. An alumnus of Lehigh University, Columbia University, and Wolfson College, where he completed his DPhil, Ira Lieberman has had a distinguished career in finance, consultancy, and biotechnology. Among his various roles at the World Bank in Washington, DC, Ira was responsible for overseeing all private and financial sector work in the transition economies of Central and Eastern Europe, the Commonwealth of Independent States, and Turkey. He was also chief executive of the consultative group to assist the poorest, where he created and managed an international secretariat for 26 bilateral and multilateral donors to support the development and sustainability of microfinance institutions throughout the developing world. He worked in several countries on crisis resolution and post-crisis industrial restructuring, including Mexico, Korea, Turkey, and Argentina. Ira has been president and chief executive officer of LIPAM International since October 20, 2004. And in this capacity, he's advised governments, not-for-profit institutions and private companies in emerging market, transition and developing market country, countries. Much of his advisory work has focused on the microfinance sector, where he served on the board of directors of several institutions in the sector and has also raised funds primarily for microfinance institutions uh, in uh, microfinance investment funds, pardon me, in Africa. Jennifer Isern uh, studied at the University of Montana, Princeton University and Nova Southeastern University, where she received her PhD. She served for 23 years in multiple roles in the International Finance Corporation and the World Bank Group, including as senior manager for Southeast Asia, for South Asia, and later in East Asia and the Pacific. With the World Bank Group, Dr. Isern was based in New Delhi and Hanoi, leading regional teams to support clients on financial and private sector development, with a focus on expanding access to finance for households and SMEs, fintech and payments, financial infrastructure, debt resolution and insolvency, agribusiness and capital markets. Jennifer has written more than 50 publications on financial sector development and broader development issues, and launched Catalyze Global Impact LLC to promote investing and technical assistance to leverage financial and private sector solutions that improve the quality of life for people globally. Today, Ira and Jennifer will be speaking for about 40 minutes and we'll be happy to take questions afterwards. To ask a question, please type it into the chat function and I will relay it to them. Just to note as well that we are recording today's session. Thank you for joining us and over to you, Ira and Jennifer. Uh, you thank you very much and uh, for the kind introduction. It is my pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. And I want to thank you, David and Claire Norton for organizing this talk and inviting us to speak with you. I was at the college uh, with my family mid-career after almost 20 years in private business from 1982 to 1985, and they were some of the best years uh, of our life. So it is always my pleasure to be back in college, if even virtual. 
virtual uh, acquaintance again. I propose to discuss microfinance in the context of the current COVID-19 crisis, uh, poverty creation derived from the crisis and the role of microfinance and poverty alleviation in the, in the developing world. I will divide my talk in two parts, first discussing global poverty and the current crisis. Uh, I will do so briefly, though it's a very complex subject that we could discuss for an extended period of time. And I guess along with poverty goes deep inequality. Uh, I will then discuss microfinance, its role in poverty alleviation and its renewed importance to the, to the crisis. Also the existential threat to the sector due to the crisis. My colleague and close friend, uh, Jennifer Eastern will then speak to you about microfinance in India, possibly other parts of Asia. And as you said, Jennifer lived in Delhi for, I thought for five or six years, it turns out seven years, plus uh, Hanoi or Vietnam for two years. And she had extensive managerial responsibility for the financial sector across Asia. Uh, you have seen our two chapters or her two chapters on Asia, one on India and one on Asia, my chapter on the commercial evolution of microfinance uh, posted in the college. So it's, it's available to you. I propose to talk for about 20 minutes, Jennifer about 20 minutes, and then we'll open for 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, so first, let me talk about poverty. I've been reading a, a great deal about poverty recently as a research for a book I am writing about the current crisis. It's a sequel to a book I published in 2018 on a history of financial and economic crises uh, titled in good times prepare for crisis. I also, it was also published by Brookings Institution Press. Uh, and part of this book is based on the work I did for my DPhil thesis at Oxford. Much of my current reading on poverty is based on a World Bank report published in October, 2020 called Monitoring Global Poverty. The report discusses poverty from three perspectives. Absolute poverty broken down into three subsid subdivisions. First is the poorest living on $1.90 a day or less. These people live primarily in low income developing countries, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, with a world population estimated at 7.64 billion people, almost 8 billion people, and the poorest estimated at 9%. This gives us a figure of some 700 million considered as the poorest. Let me be clear about this definition of $1.90 a day. It is based on household surveys from all over the world and is not a census measure, is not an accurate measure per se, but a benchmark. Also, this does not mean that these very poor people earn exactly $1.90 a day. Some days they may earn $5 or $10 and then go a week or weeks without earning anything. So cash flow management is a very important part of, of their existence. Most of the poorest live in rural village or communities and are subsistence farmers growing enough for their families to survive. Others live in poor urban slums and mostly work in the informal sector, meaning they do not have salary jobs or are regularly, regular hourly wage, wage earners but instead are mostly market traders or run small family businesses with no employees except family members or unpaid apprentices. These smaller micro businesses are known as family or lifestyle businesses because the family depends on this business for food, healthcare, clothing, rent, and above all other necessities. Uh, informal family style businesses have been deeply affected by the lockdown. And these are the prime clients of microfinance institutions. 
the second fixed measure of poverty is $3.20 a day, mostly the population of lower middle income countries uh, in South and East Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and some extent Africa. The World Bank estimates that 25% of the world's population live on $3.20 a day. Again, the same caveat applies. It does not mean every day. Uh, based on a world population figure of near 8 billion, this group represents some 1.9 billion poor people. And the third category is $5.50 a day, people living in high middle income developing countries. The World Bank estimate is that 40% of the world's population lives on $5.50 a day or some 3 billion people. The conclusion from these numbers is that in addition to the very poorest, there are a great number of other people in the world living at the margin who could easily fall back into deeper poverty. And that is exactly what is happening now due to the COVID crisis. After 20 years of poverty reduction, on average by 1% a year, largely due to the rise of India, of China, and some extent India, the, the, this crisis is now reversing the trend. The World Bank has estimated that the COVID crisis pushed some 80 to 110 million poor people into deep poverty over the course of 2020 and will push up to 150 million by the end of 2021 and perhaps many more in the few years after that, depending on the ability to contain the pandemic, which are present, as you know, is a race between the variants of the coronavirus and the ability to vaccinate the world's population. With the coronavirus surging in major countries such as Brazil and India and surrounding countries, and much of the developing world finding it very diff difficult to secure vaccines, it would appear that much of the de developing world will not be vaccinated until 2023 or 2024. This unfortunately will provide time for new variants to erupt and for poverty to increase. Let me briefly read a World Bank press release on its poverty estimate from October 7th, 2020. I, I quote, the COVID-19 pandemic is estimated to push an additional 88 to 100 million people into poverty with a total rising to as many as 150 million by 2021. Depending on the severity of the economic contraction. Extreme poverty defined as living on less than $1.90 a day is likely to affect between 9.1 and 9.4% of the world's population in 2020. Had the pandemic not convulsed the globe, the poverty rate was expected to be 7.9% in 2020. This would represent, meaning the, the increase in poverty from the current crisis, a regression to the rate of 9.2% in 2017. This also report also finds that many of the new poor will be in countries that already have a high poverty rate. A number of middle income countries will see significant numbers of people slip below the poverty line. About 82% of the total will be in middle income countries, this report estimates. And we, the World Bank, will be deploying 160 million in financial support over 15 months to help more than 100 countries protect the poor and vulnerable, support businesses, and bolster economic recovery. Uh, this includes $50 billion from IDA resources. That, that is uh, the World Bank's uh, concessional uh, arm. And the bank I know in another announcement uh, provided $12 billion to COVAX for uh, purchasing vaccines or perhaps for production. So now let's move uh, to microfinance and poverty alleviation. Um, 
let me talk briefly about the origins of microfinance. When microfinance, as we know it today, began in the 1980s, there were some 1.5 billion people living in poverty, mostly in South Asia and Africa. Microfinance started in Bangladesh, one of the poorest countries in the world, through Muhammad Yunus, who founded the Grameen Bank and won the Nobel Peace Prize for this groundbreaking work in microfinance. And Yunus was on our advisory board uh, for the five years that I ran CGAP. Uh, so I got to know him very well. Uh, Grameen provided small working capital loans to women who were self-employed, who one knew anything about the microfinance sector or industry in the 1980s, there were three major institutions known to the world as known as microfinance institutions or MFIs, which stood out. Grameen Bank, Bank Reykjavik Indonesia, and Banco Sol in Bolivia, to which I would add BRAC also based in Bangladesh, which did many things. BRAC to me has always been one of the best national NGOs in the world and BRAC ran schools for girls, it run, ran a small business bank, it ran training programs for SMEs and many other th things to help the poor in Bangladesh. MFIs or microfinance institutions are essentially community-based lending institutions. But these three that I mentioned, Grameen, Bank Rakhiyad and Bank Sol, soon operated on a national scale. Most of the other MFIs were small NGOs, not-for-profit institutions, operating in a single region or area of a country with a few thousand clients. In 1995, when I started the consultative group to assist the poor, CGAP at the World Bank, which soon became the World Secretariat for the sector, microfinance was assisting some 10 million poor people mostly self-employed and working in the informal sector. And by the way, Jennifer uh, Eastern joined CGAP soon after we started. And I think she was with them uh, quite a bit of time after I had left for some 12 years in total. The evolution and commercial of, of microfinance and product diversification. In the 1990s, microfinance institutions began to scale up and began to offer diversified products and financial services to their clients. These included micro insurance, remittances, funds transfers, housing rehabilitation loans, and education loans, amongst others. Most importantly, as MFIs reach scale with 50 to 100,000 clients or more, and in the late 90s, there are many of these, MFIs began to commercialize. They began, became legal entities and converted from NGO status and attracted uh, investors, many of which came from the private sector through investment funds. By 2012, there were about 100 different investment funds, 70 of which were debt funds and 30 were equity funds, and they, they had committed over $12 billion to the sector. Many of these commercial uh, microfinance institutions were regulated and supervised by the national banking supervisor in the country, which in turn allowed these regulated MFIs to mobilize savings for the poor. It turns out that the poor may need, uh, a f may need to find a safe place to save as much or even more than they need loans. Saving left in the house or a coffee can in the garden tend to be expropriated by family or friends or others. It is also the case that a funeral, and there were many in Africa at that time due to HIV AIDS or a daughter's wedding could throw a family into deep poverty. So microfinance savings prevented the family from falling into deep poverty uh, from which it was very difficult to escape, and also from resorting to money lenders, which also ended in uh, deep poverty most of the time. Savings also became a source of capital for the MFI, which allowed it 
allowed the MFI to online to other clients and scale up. So where are we now? In 1995, when CGAP started the sector, it was supporting 10 million clients, as I mentioned. CGAP's goal was, and the sector's goal was to reach 100 million clients. And now the industry now supports some 200 million clients plus their families, which could be six or 700 million people in total. And this is probably many more if we had Chinese fintechs and micro lending through institutions such as Alibaba and Ant. MF, MFIs are organized in a variety of forms. The majority are still NGOs. They're credit co cooperatives, mainly in West Africa, based on French savings association practices. There are credit unions, for example, Vietnam has very large credit union movement. There are non-bank financial institutions as corporations, and there are commercial banks, many of which are regulated, and as I mentioned, collect savings. Technology, such as digital finance, uh, is increasingly becoming a major uh, addition to microfinance operations, extending outreach in countries to the poor. Uh, we don't have time to talk uh, about digitalization and, and technology, but Kenya is an outstanding example, having mobilized about 20 million, million people uh, through their uh, digital finance program. By size, 41% of MFIs still have less than 10,000 clients. Another 40 one percent have over 10,000 clients, but less than 100,000 clients, and 16% have over 100,000 clients, but less than a million clients, and 2% have over a million clients. But 86% of borrowers and 77% of savers are concentrated in MFIs with over 100 million clients. So there are about 200 or so, maybe more now, investable MFIs uh, that constitute the bulk of the commercialized sector and have the most, the largest portfolios. These larger institutions on average charge lower interest rates than the smaller ones, but they are also more profitable and they have been able to scale and extend uh, ongoing loans and larger loans and sometimes multi-year loans and more diverse loans to their clients. So I'm gonna wrap up in a minute and talk to you uh, about poverty alleviation and microfinance. A number of economists have criticized microfinance because it does not seem to meet its original promise of poverty alleviation. For those of us who have been involved in the sector since takeoff, it was always clear that of and by itself, microfinance could not relieve poverty. You need the other dimensions under the World Bank's multi-dimensional poverty measure, education, infrastructure, meaning water, electricity, and san sanitation, and growing economies so economic opportunities can improve. What does microfinance do? It smooths income and can prevent families from slipping into deep poverty, both through savings mo mobilization and loans so that the micro entrepreneur can grow his or her business or farming operation. It has also empowered women as the majority of micro loans are provided to self-employed women. Where the economists who have studied microfinance and poverty get it wrong in my view is, is in not recognizing that microfinance is a generational approach to poverty allevi alleviation in visiting villages in Mexico to observe clients of Compartamos, Mexico's largest MFIs and one of the largest in the world, I heard over and over again from the women who were clients, at least my children are in school. And that reminded me of the Irish, Italian, Jewish, and more recently Latino immigrants who arrived to the US very poor, but were also able to educate their children, which in turn largely address the poverty issue over time. Now, finally, the, to wrap up the COVID crisis in microfinance, the 
current crisis both an existential threat to MFIs and their clients and an opportunity. The threat is that many of the clients of MFIs in low and middle income countries had to shut down their micro and small businesses and will not be able to pay their loans back. Also clients of MFIs will be forced to draw down their survey savings in emergency and they have done so. This in turn will make it difficult for MFIs to repay their loans to investment funds and others uh, like the interbank market and other, other funding sources. In an initial step recognizing the nature of the crisis, many MFIs allowed their clients to roll over their loans, a practice which was highly discouraged previously. Uh, and uh, in turn, investment funds have extended or restructured their loans to MFIs. Um, However, if this crisis goes on, we can expect to see extensive insolvencies and bankruptcies among smaller and mid-scale MFIs. The opportunity given the growth in poverty due to the crisis is that microfinance and MFIs will be needed more than ever and donor institutions will need to step up in the system. My colleague, Paul DeLeo, and a co-editor of the book who runs investment funds in both India and Latin America, has estimated that in the next couple of years, microfinance will need about $12 billion in, in capital, of which approximately 8 billion would be debt and 4 billion would be equity. The debt is probably achievable, but the equity will be very difficult to come by. Uh, due to the present, pandemic and associated economic crisis, presenting an existential threat to many of the smaller and medium-sized MFIs. I, I took a bit longer than I intended, but let me now pass to Jennifer, who will discuss the case of India, uh, at which we all recognize the present as a great tragedy. Uh, my prayers are with the Indian people and a hope for exit from the prevent, present wave killing so many uh, poor people. Jennifer. Many thanks, Ira, and hello and good afternoon or evening to those joining. Uh, special thanks to David and Claire at the University of Oxford and the Wolfson College for organizing this discussion and a very heartfelt thanks to Ira for our ongoing collaboration and friendship over many, many years. India's progress towards financial inclusion has been a Himalayan feat. Uh, several aspects are key to India's progress and yet still challenges remain, even pre-pandemic and certainly now. Um, I'd like to organize my comments as follows. First, a very brief summary and, and history of the, the current financial inclusion sector uh, in the country. A second, effects of the COVID crisis and three, potential uh, of, for the future as well as recommendations. Um, so first, uh, a very brief history and summary for an ancient country and an incredibly dynamic financial sector. Um, as has been mentioned, I am truly grateful to have been able to live in uh, New Delhi for seven years and I was able to travel widely across India and South Asia while I was manager uh, for the financial sector for IFC, the International Finance Corporation. Um, in South Asia from 2009 to 2016. And I've remained involved uh, in my own capacity with my own firm uh, uh, over the last five years uh, since. So this experience informs my perspective and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Uh, so India experienced a much later start on large scale financial inclusion efforts than some countries, including neighboring Bangladesh, as I mentioned, and many countries across Africa and uh, Latin America, where financial inclusion grew tremendously from the 1970s to the 1990s and beyond. Meanwhile, financial inclusion in India experienced significant growth, especially since 2005, but today represents a mature field compared with many other countries. And just one number of a, a loan portfolio from the microfinance institutions or financial service providers that are members of IMFIN, which is uh, one of the two self-regulatory bodies in the country, 
their loan portfolio cumulative as of December 2020 is just over $31 billion US. Uh, so it's a massive industry uh, across India and, and as Ira was showing as well across the world. So what are the keys to India's remarkable and I would say very quick progress? Uh, it truly has been a Himalayan feat. Hundreds of millions of people who have gained access to financial services, especially over the last 15 years. Now today, India is really a, a global role model for the potential of financial inclusion, as well as the successful nexus of efforts between both public and private sectors. So in terms of um, some of the, let me break this down in terms of some of the key pillars. Um, so I, I really believe India has experienced visionary efforts across an ambitious, national financial inclusion campaign promoted by two successive governments, administrations, prudent regulation and supervision by the central bank, the Reserve Bank of India, the RBI, leading innovations in payment systems and tremendous progress across many new types of financial service providers. Obviously another factor is, is the sheer size of the market and diversity across and within states, across urban and rural areas that are really helping drive innovations. So to, to break this down, um, the first pillar I see in, in terms of this story is a really broad and diverse range of financial service providers that have been authorized to operate over the years, authorized by the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, microfinance institutions, self-help groups, commercial banks, regional rural banks, urban cooperatives, housing finance companies, non-bank finance uh, companies, payments banks, small finance banks, fintechs, and new universal banks, all with different levels of regulation and supervision and the services that they're authorized to offer. And most importantly, I think, is this field attracted people talent, really capable people with skills in community development, financial services, investments that have led to incredibly high quality institutions. The sector has also expanded services, especially over the last 10 years, uh, where it was very narrow focus on microcredit and on the debt side for, um, for clients. But in recent years, payments have, paid, have also played a central role, a very dynamic payment sector. Um, and likewise, institutions are starting to give more focus on offering deposit and insurance services. Some have been pioneers in this for a long time, but it's, it's not ubiquitous across the market. A second key pillar in the Indian story are government initiatives. And again, across at least two administrations, but going back many decades um, uh, of, of government focus on the financial inclusion sector. Uh, first is Aadhaar, a unique identification system using biometrics that was launched in 2009 and rapid growth with effective national coverage within nine years of 1.3 billion people. It's just, it's, it, uh, it's just incredible uh, what was achieved. And uh, the unique identification led to knowing your customer, KYC, which is in, important for banks opening accounts, and subsequently uh, digital eKYC, which was permitted. Um, a second is the National Campaign for Bank Accounts, uh, the PMJDY program, which reached, depending on the reports uh, and, and their own uh, statistics, up to 90 to 100% of households, and they're now looking at uh, breaking that down for uh, heads of household, uh, men and women, uh, and, and going even further in terms of opening bank accounts. Uh, there were some issues with the campaign initially, I think especially around some account duplication and, and dormancy of accounts, but I think overall this has been a positive uh, experience to increase access to bank services. A third is an incredibly dynamic interoperable payments system with a number of payments programs uh, led by the National Payments Corporation of India, which is owned by the Reserve Bank of India and the Indian Banks Association with um, immediate payment service, IMPS, uh, a very successful domestic debit card scheme, Rupay, the United Payment uh, Interface UPI, which is a phone application for payments and banking features, and the Bharat Interface for Money, BIM, uh, which is a bank and payments application uh, that really links up phones and bank accounts and, and allows incredibly easy, fast, uh, low cost uh, payment services for hundreds of millions of people. 
Um, a fourth is of, of government initiatives is expanded service points. The central bank really encouraged banks to install ATMs. They allowed white label third party ATM companies to service uh, a broad range of POS point of sale services that became micro ATMs. They issued guidelines for agent banking, all of this to really expand service points beyond uh, uh, bank branches or microfinance branches. And last uh, that I'd like to flag are um, a number of states and, and eventually national government agencies piloted government payments and benefits programs uh, over the last seven plus years. I was involved in one starting in uh, 2009, um, which really helped uh, promote uh, these, these benefit or social welfare programs across a range of sectors and health and education, rural development, agriculture, et cetera. And those have really grown to become a large scale focus on government uh, to person payments and digitizing these, both to encourage usage of all these new accounts that were opened, but also I think as importantly, if not more so, to make government programs, these social welfare programs more efficient and to reach the intended beneficiaries through payments directly into their accounts. A third key pillar is the appropriate proportionate and risk-based regulation and supervision from the central bank, the Reserve Bank of India, and a series of reforms and new licenses for financial service providers. A broad range offering services uh, to the microfinance clients, to households, and to businesses. Uh, and more recently, we've seen uh, the RBI manage reforms and mergers of public sector banks, which were long analyzed and long awaited as well as new licensing for fintechs and the amended insolvency and bankruptcy code in, in 2019. Um, a fourth key pillar and the last pillar I'd like to mention in this tremendous story of India's uh, progress on financial inclusion are the very well established supporting institutions at the meso level. Um, since MFIs were initially not allowed to mobilize savings from clients, they needed access to funds and they borrowed from banks that bank lending was critical. And ICICI Bank led the charge, but also SIDB and Nabard, two very strong uh, development finance institutions uh, with a long and successful history uh, in India, as well as incubators and advocates, um, startup incubators, if you like, uh, development organizations, consulting firms, credit rating firms uh, that really provide a lot of essential analysis for the sector and two microfinance professional associations that really evolved into professional self-regulatory organizations, MFIN and SADAN, which is slightly older. Um, investors, an incredible range of investors, specialized national and international investors that offer a range of debt, equity, and guarantees in various rounds of financing. And last is, is I think an incredible underpinning of the sector is the credit reporting, the RBI, had licensed one credit bureau and, and um, about 10, 11, 12 years ago, they uh, licensed another three credit bureaus. The industry then agreed on common reporting formats. Um, in 2014, the RBI required financial service providers to share data with the credit bureaus. That really was a big share is the effects of the COVID pandemic. Uh, the dual effects of COVID, both the health pandemic and the economic lockdowns have really challenged household businesses and the financial service providers. And in India, about half of lower income people have said that their family financial situation was much worse during the pandemic with 81% experiencing a decline uh, in March, April, a year ago, according to a study that I think was very well done by 60 decibels. Uh, the lockdowns last year triggered massive reverse migration as daily laborers in urban areas returned to their rural homes when their work sites were closed. A number of sectors were especially affected by these lockdowns. Um, the urban micro and small businesses, market traders, uh, restaurants and food providers, transport operators, the education sector and, and beyond. As well, many old MFIs and, and other uh, similar financial service providers respected this moratorium and allowed clients to pause their loan repayments. But this created a massive liquidity squeeze for many financial service providers. The clients were withdrawing their savings, they were slowing new savings deposits, they were pausing loan repayments. 
and this liquidity squeeze was further exacerbated as many MFIs were still required to repay their, their existing loans back to the banks uh, that were on lending to them. Towards the end of 2020, portfolio quality was improving and MFIs were starting to issue new loans again in October to December last year. And it was very comparable to the same period of uh, pre-pandemic in 2019. Most financial service providers really managed, uh, again, with shoestring situations, but they manage, albeit with effects on portfolio quality. And the industry as a whole was reporting overall uh, repayment levels at about 90% of expected levels as of March 2021. However, liquidity is still a concern, and especially for the smaller institutions, uh, and profitability has decreased uh, for most financial service providers given loan loss provisions and, and write-offs. Yet since April, 2021, so uh, now we're in a second devastating new wave of COVID across the country. And the size of this wave is much larger than the first. The impact on households and businesses is still building and unknown. And some states are again issuing these mini lockdowns that will again affect households and businesses activities and revenues and the ability of financial service providers to uh, reach those clients to collect loan payments and service uh, any deposit accounts. Households and businesses are already much more vulnerable after the first wave and less resilient given lower incomes, often lower or depleted savings and fewer options, thinner safety nets uh, than a year ago. Uh, earlier this month, the RBI issued a second moratorium on loan repayments and authorized a new liquidity facility for small finance banks to help uh, continue on lending to the sector. And last week, Sadan, one of the two industry self-regulatory bodies, issued uh, a plea for more liquidity facilities and other measures to help ease microfinance operations. And I know that those negotiations are very much ongoing. Uh, numerous actors, including the rating firms and other analysts, are flagging fresh concerns over portfolio quality. And I think we'll see a, a much better uh, level of information. Um, the, the first uh, quarter of the new fiscal year ends in, in the end of June, but and we'll have some information then, but um, the formal audited financial statements will be issued over the coming weeks and months uh, as the fiscal year just ended at the end of March for India. Um, and also the RBI uh, is issuing periodic updates and they do an annual summary of the sector each September, October. So I think we'll have a much better sense soon over um, the impact of this second wave over the next couple of months. Um, so my third uh, area and last area that I'd like to cover um, is looking to the future. Now, until the pandemic, India was experiencing tremendous progress, and now that's uncertain. But much really depends on the eventual, and I know it will be just a matter of time, uh, but an eventual recovery uh, from the COVID pandemic. The short-term situation on portfolio quality and liquidity is being managed so far, um, and the financial service providers really did very well last year and so far uh, in this year. I am incredibly hopeful for a reasonable path to recovery and very robust long-term prospects for uh, households and businesses in the financial inclusion sector in India. Um, in the latest data that we have from Findex, which is a, a data, global database on financial inclusion managed by the World Bank Group, um, almost 80% of adults in the country uh, had access to a bank account, and that is definitely gonna be higher now. We'll have the next set of uh, Findex data uh, early next year and early 22, um, and that'll give us a better updated perspective and comparable globally. Um, there are still, even pre-pandemic, there were still issues with yield growth and concerns about overheating and over indebtedness in some states, especially Assam, which has been in the news a lot, uh, and pockets in other states. Um, the Reserve Bank of India and the Ministry of Finance have established, a, a, I think, a very robust, very well thought out financial inclusion strategy for uh, 20 through 2024 um, that calls for accessible and affordable financial services, universal access to services, a basic basket of services, financial awareness pro programs, consumer protection and grievance redressal. 
And building on this, I see a few key priorities where I'd really like to urge and recommendations uh, for the sector going forward. Again, post recovery, post pandemic. Uh, so the first is really to continue expanding access, especially to the last mile, the rural areas and vulnerable groups. Um, about 60% of the microfinance portfolio is concentrated in just six states. And there's also an urban rural divide. So it's important to optimize both the physical locations and uh, the growing digital finance uh, service points. Um, so that's bank branches, ATMs, business correspondence, uh, these physical service points really complement and reinforce the growing digital finance, um, which I'm delighted to see continue to grow. Um, I'd like to see more focus on used mobile phones versus 71% of men, and men are 33% more likely to actually own a phone, and that is the gateway to digital financial services. Um, I'd like to see as well greater usage of accounts. Um, in India, again, with the latest index data, 48% of adults with an account didn't use it. Um, that's almost double the global average of, of 25%, according to FinDEX data. Clearly, some of that was linked to those PMJDY accounts, uh, which seem to be resolving now. Um, but this is going to be a key data point that I'll be looking at when the next FinDEX survey is released in uh, early 22. A third point uh, is to get beyond microcredit. Um, I know a number of institutions, the Reserve Bank of India, Nabard, Sidbi, and many others are continuing to promote product diversification, but we really do need to get there. And that is a greater array of deposit accounts. Um, payments are doing well, but more can be done there, especially around remittances. Um, and individual loans, there's so much focus on group lending. Um, broader focus on life insurance, pensions, um, education, health, and housing finance, et cetera. Um, the, the tremendous innovation in digital finance and the whole ecosystem there is, is really cutting edge. India is very much on the cutting edge here. And I see much more potential around virtual banks, using alternative data for credit scoring, broader usage in international payments and offline payments. Um, expanding point of sale and QR codes and, and the facility that that brings, and just a much broader range of financial services. And that includes for the micro and the small and medium enterprise. I, I think that market may be at least 10 times the size of the traditional microfinance market that we know in India. Enormous gaps uh, in the market for MSMEs or micro SMEs um, and the agri-value chains but also the broader supply chains, trade finance, vehicle finance, et cetera. Um, in terms of shifting from individual uh, group lending towards individual lending and the small and, and micro business lending, um, MFIs are restricted by regulation currently. 85% uh, of MFI assets must be in joint liability group loans. Some MFIs have started pilots uh, for MSME loans and graduating clients to individual or business loans, uh, but there's still room uh, for them to go up to that 15% that limit, um, and many are not yet truly piloting this. And I think that there's tremendous potential here. Much of the rest of the world in financial inclusion has gone to individual loans and, and really uh, working very well on uh, small business loans. Um, and last but most importantly, uh, a recommendation, and, and I think this has even more urgency given the COVID pandemic, is consumer protection and data privacy. Clients need to be aware of their rights and responsibilities and have effective recourse in the event of any issues with their financial service providers. Uh, the RBI has regulations along these lines and, and good progress and a good banking uh, ombudsman program but this needs to remain front and center for the financial inclusion industry across India and, and globally. So in conclusion, um, the Indian financial sector offers the world so many lessons and good experience, but this current second wave of COVID is devastating. And my thoughts are with many friends and colleagues across India. Clearly the digital and financial inclusion is helping both households and businesses cope during this time. And um, since March 2020, as many as 230 million people may have already been pushed back into poverty by the pandemic, and this is not over. 
the financial inclusion sector can play a tremendous role in helping businesses and households cope and recover from this crisis. These institutions have been resilient in earlier crises. The RBI is a very well-established regulator and supervisor and intermediary institutions such as the banks, Nabard, Sidby, and other DFIs and investors are experienced and available to help. I remain optimistic in the dynamism and the resilience of the Indian financial inclusion sector. And I look forward to seeing the progress they make to help households and businesses recover from the pandemic. Perhaps while you're, uh, you, you're um, thinking of those, I'll just begin with, with one of my own. Um, and I suppose it's a question to, to either one of you. Um, and that's whether the experience of COVID will fundamentally change the business model of MFIs, or whether you think the current crisis will be a temporary, albeit very large, disruption. Jennifer, you want to go? Okay. Um, well, thanks, uh, David. I, I really see COVID and the lockdowns accelerating the shift to digital. Um, and many MFIs and broader financial service providers have been making the shift. We've all been working from home. Uh, where possible. Um, and uh, that's very much been the case for financial service providers. Um, and yet, uh, the physical service points are still important with agents to help answer client questions, provide services, help enroll clients, uh, resolve issues, that kind of thing. Um, digital will help uh, reach scale, but we still need those physical service points. And I think post lockdowns and, and, and in recovery, um, that's gonna, that, that optimizing that mix of digital and physical is gonna be really important. But we're definitely seeing an acceleration of the trend towards digital. We work with their clients and communities and uh, are frequently in touch with them, including taking repayments in villages, uh, not necessarily at the branch level. And digital is, we call low touch because it's done technically, it's done through uh, online and um, internet banking systems. And so the ideal balance is to get the low touch of digital finance and the high touch of microfinance together to service clients. And when you can get that right, then you really have an outstanding uh, program. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. And while we just wait, we'll give others an opportunity to uh, compose a question. I'll, I'll just ask one, one more of my own, um, which is that Ira, you mentioned the example of Kenya as having mobilized 20 million people through um, a digital finance program. And I, I wonder what you thought other countries, perhaps particularly in Africa, um, might learn from, from the example in, in Kenya. Well, uh, Jennifer and I were on a board together, and she's still on the board. She brought me on an initial league called Famiga, and Famiga has a network of about 15 microfinance institutions, uh, many of them reaching rural clientele throughout Africa, East and West Africa. And uh, I know there's a great push at Famiga to, to move their clients to digital finance. It, it's very hard during the current crisis because um, it, it takes a lot of planning, it takes capital, it takes a very good board of directors to un governance to understand the risks in hands. And then you need to mobilize a network of agents throughout the country. Uh, and these can be small mom and pop stores that, that handle the cash coming in as deposits or loans to people, particularly in remote rural areas. And so I think the progress in digitalization is gonna be slow during this crisis, but then I agree with Jennifer, it's going to renew vigorously. And, and that's what the, the model looks like now. And that's where the great push is in Africa. Kenya got lucky because it had a, a very good mobile carrier and they quickly moved to develop a, a program called Safaricom. And uh, it just reached out to the country very rapidly. And two of the big microfinance institutions, Equity Bank 
and, and KREP Bank, which now has another name, got on board very quickly and extended it to their clients. I don't think there's another example in Africa yet up to Kenya's scale, uh, but I think Jennifer's discussion of India, India, Philippines, other countries in Asia are certainly making a push at it. And Latin America has been very slow to date to get on board, but it may well be happening. Jennifer, you have any? I think um, definitely Kenya was a, a leader, um, but we're also seeing uh, Uganda, Tanzania, Nigeria has really taken off the last couple of years in terms of digital, um, as well as Senegal, Ivory Coast. Um, it's it's really, we're seeing pockets of, uh, and, and often this is being led, as I rightly said, the mobile, uh, the mobile telco operators who are leading this and, and their linkages through mobile wallets, but also their linkages with banks and other financial service providers. And a number of the, the telco operators across both East and West Africa and Southern Africa are, are regional in nature. So they are piloting things in one country and, and bringing it across border. And I think that has potential, enormous uh, potential for the future because you can see uh, regional payments developing more rapidly. And also given the, the regional nature of some of the central banks and VCL and BAAC, and of course the economic cooperation areas in East Africa. Thank you. And I'll just ask one, one more question of my own um, in, uh, in the absence of other- The absorbing technology and the phones are, you know, they're glued to their hands and whatever is coming next is they're gonna be even faster and, and better. Um, so they're a natural market for digital finance. Um, but my concern is that we need to have products that are responsibly marketed and, and well-designed for the cash flows and, and the socioeconomic profiles of youth. Um, you know, if they have allowances or, or part-time jobs, those kinds of things, but we really need to avoid over-indebting youth uh, early on. So I would like to see a focus on savings products um, and on payments and eventually help youth build up, you know, a, maybe a, a good corpus of, of savings that they can use towards education or later in life, they would have a good corpus built up for a down payment on a house or, or whatever. But to really look at um, getting youth enrolled early in financial services with appropriate products, with good consumer protections, uh, but getting them into that whole savings and payments system to help them manage their, their own households in, in the future. Aside from my- With which they continually juggle. Rural people may have registered bank accounts but are unable to manage formal credits. The informal economy is half GDP and 90% of employment, but what pro proportion of India's financial sector is informal? That's a great question. and. Uh, it's something that we tried to tackle while I was based in Delhi is to better understand the informal market. Um, and I agree during this, uh, this crisis, uh, the informal market is very much drying up. Um, but that informal market is also incredibly resilient. Uh, my first experience in uh, financial inclusion back in 1990 was in Niger. We were basically replicating informal markets, uh, informal group savings schemes. And that grew into the largest microfinance institution in Niger. Um, but that is very much what, what microfinance or a good successful financial service provider should be doing is looking at the cash flows of households and replicating what works from informal finance. Um, but you know, to, very much to the question, um, very much the, the informal sector is, is being battered. And uh, as I mentioned, the, I think the safety nets are much thinner. People have sold off assets. Uh, people have depleted their uh, savings accounts, uh, savings balances, wherever they were, whether they were in kind or in cash. Um, and, and I see this as a very deep crisis right now uh, for urban and rural uh, across India and, and many countries. And I think it's gonna take us a while to dig out of this. But I do see an incredibly resilient financial services provider network um, who have managed multiple crises in the past uh, exceptionally well, but it, it's going to take us some time to dig out of this. I also see the Reserve Bank of India being very responsive, I think very responsible and proactive, 
um, and a number of government programs. So um, I share your concern, Barbara, um, and, and I think this is, is gonna be a, a very deep crisis in rural, but also urban areas. I have a question now from Venkat Nikhil, and he asks, um, COVID has eroded a lot of savings of the poor because of lockdowns and also hospitalization expenses, especially India. Given this, will there be a change in approach for MFIs in terms of lending to this set of people? Um, well, yeah. I'll, I'll take a shot. Time. Look, MFIs were lending to people before there were savings. Mm -hmm. For a long while, MFIs were not allowed to take savings because they were not regulated. They were mainly NGOs and still 41%, at least from the latest data, I don't know what the percentage is now, from the data we had around 2015, I would say 2016, 41% um, uh, of MFIs were NGOs, not for profit institutions not formalized institutions, not taking savings. So indeed, um, people not having savings can get uh, loans, but they need a way to show that they can repay. They need a viable income. And if lockdowns persist or people have lost, uh, you know, their, their, their jobs or their wages in an informal or formal economy, then it's gonna be hard for them to get microfinance loans. But that is the role of microfinance to serve people in the informal economy or one of the roles traditionally. And so hopefully that will continue. We're gonna to need to have the donor community step up and provide renewed capital to microfinance. They've been stepping away from microfinance because microfinance was so successful in raising liquidity on its own, but I truly believe we're going to need to reintroduce uh, even subsidies, which had largely disappeared for a period of time to get MFIs back on, on their feet. And there's nothing wrong with targeted subsidies if these are the, the key institutions in serving uh, rural and urban poor, uh, largely in the informal sector. Jennifer, did I, did I get that right? Absolutely. Spot on, Ira. Yeah. We have one more question. I think we'll make this our final question um, this evening. Um, you've both given us a, a lot of your time generously tonight. Um, the final question is from Sophie Thorup. Yeah, it succeeded um, in, in a few different uh, uh, with a few different companies, but the last company I ran was a large worldwide trading uh, company and eventually a manufacturing company. And uh, we had operations all over the world and it was owned by one family. And I ran much of that empire for one family. So I had the means to come back to school. When I was in school in the States, both undergraduate and graduate university, I had to work at the same time and pay my tuition. A lot of students in the States work their way through school, but now it's very hard given how high tuitions are. In the case of my work uh, at Oxford and Wolfson, uh, the idea was that I got interest in the World Bank. I knew nothing about the World Bank, even though I'd worked all over the world in private industry. And I read a lot of World Bank literature for my thesis. And I wrote a cold letter to the World Bank and miraculously, I got called in for an interview about a week after I st started looking for, for jobs. I, I was in New York at a friend's office and he lent me his office to start doing job searches. And lo and behold, the, the World Bank called my home in Oxford and got my wife and said, we'd like him to come down to Washington. And within a week I had a job offer. So it was one of these lucky things, but I worked, my, my thesis was on a history of sovereign debt crises. And uh, near the end of my career at the World Bank, I did nothing but work on sovereign and uh, world uh, sovereign debt and financial crises. 
in East Asia, in Mexico. Once again, for, uh, for, a, for a tremendous talk, very informative. Um, I suppose, in, in some senses, a rather optimistic talk in your predictions for the future of the sector, particularly against the, the very bleak current economic and, uh, and health background in, in South Asia in particular. Um, so much, much food for thought for all of us. Thank you very much again. And um, if anybody does have any further questions that occur to